Hello, this is Free Thought Forum, a program by the uh, Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. I am Jonas Holderman. And I'm Joe Barnhart, and we welcome you. And we want you to know that if you don't believe in God, you're not alone. Right here in East Tennessee, you can find free-thinking atheists and agnostics. The show is not only for them, but for all people curious about living a life free of supernatural mm. beliefs. Today we're going to discuss the problem of suffering. Suffering and evil, yes. And that's, you want to move right into it? Or you got well, some? let's see, this is a call-in show. And uh, while we go over a few announcements, we invite you to start, get ready to call in at the number that's on the screen. Get a pen and paper. We will give you our email address later in the show. Uh, happy hour with the Atheist Society of Knoxville. Uh, meet up at Barley's tonight after the show. Food, drink, and conversation. Uh, Thursday, March the 3rd, uh, 2011 at 7 p.m. There's an Ask Impromptu meetup at the Cairo Cafe. Look for the silver jacketed copy of The God Delusion standing upright on the table. And Sunday morning on the uh, 6th of March, the Rationalist of East Tennessee, a very interesting group, will meet to talk about the Four Horsemen, a moderate, <coughs> moderated uh, discussion of this. Uh, go ahead and finish that. Would you? <laughs> so I, I can't see that far. Uh, okay. Uh, please uh, visit our website and uh, for additional details, including time and location. Uh, if, do you have out of friends who out of town friends who would like to watch our program? Now they can uh, send them to ctvnox.org. That's community television ctvnox.org. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me, Joe. Um, it seems to me that we're, we're talking about the problem of su suffering, but um, uh, in the natural world, uh, suffering is part of the cycle of life, a birth, life, and death. Uh -huh. And uh, it's uh, kind of relative what suffering for the lamb may uh, be a bonanza for the lion. And in theological terms, it, uh, it seems to me that without suffering, there can be no redemption. Well, that's like if, if there weren't for uh, cancer, there wouldn't be need for uh, uh, certain kinds of doctors. <laughs> uh, what's interesting is, is people who believe in heaven, uh, you know, they think through this. One reason for wanting to ha go to heaven is no sickness, you see, no pain, no agony. So uh, now one of the theories, which we'll get into later, is to try to uh, explain why there is so much suffering and uh, evil in the world. Um, if you're a naturalist, you say, well, it's, it's part of the natural thing for there to be suffering but you still have to explain specific kinds of suffering and so forth. If you're into, into the theological point of view, the problem is if, if the deity, God, is absolutely good and all-powerful, then theologians over the century have recognized this is a major problem. Uh, John... Milton wrote an outstanding <clears throat> epic in poetry called Paradise Lost and Paradise Gained, too. For, I remember in high school, I called it Paradise Found. I got a half credit for that. <laughs> that a good teacher. <laughs> but but the, the important thing is that, uh, that people who believe in God and are rational are trying to explain this, to make sense of it. And, and, and you can... They are like you and me. We are trying to explain things. They're not, they're not a different species. Yeah. Isn't this just a problem of expectation? A belief is expectation. They expect the world, if God is perfectly good and is omnipotent and all-knowing, then wouldn't you expect a better world? Now, you have to have then uh, some way to explain it. And if you look at the Bible, you have several approaches to this, one of which is in Genesis 6. It says that uh, God made, had already uh, made the world. I mean, it's assumed in, uh, earlier. And now he has sons of God, and you can big, big debate is what that means, are, are finding the daughters of, of, of uh, human beings beautiful, and they want to mate with them. Then, and that seemingly uh, uh, is not 
uh, proved. It's not clear in this sixth chapter of Genesis. But the <clears throat> Lord looks down and finds that the, the world of human beings are they're pretty wicked. That, that's, and so what does he want to do? Obliterate them. You have here an extermination uh, program. Now, here's, this is a problem of evil. <laughs> See, if God is omniscient, that means he can foresee all the future. And if he's omnipotent, it means he doesn't have to create. But if he does create, he, does, he can choose the particulars. So one of the problems that theologians saw, if God saw ahead that most of the human race would be ruined, why didn't he go back to the drawing board and come up with a better deal, you see, a better program? Well, then they have to have another way of trying. And you can, you can sympathize with this because whether you're doing biology or physics or psychology, you have theories and some of them break down. And so, or they, they get weak and you have to modify them. And you can find the history in the Bible here you have God. It, the translation here is he bitterly regretted that he had made the human race. Now, that means uh, he made a mistake, you see? So that is one way these writers are trying to say that God simply didn't control it all. <laughs> see? In that sense, it's a little bit like the view of a naturalist saying, well, nobody's controlling it totally. Then you have other views in the Bible uh, trying to explain this. Now, the Satan theory is not in the third chapter of Genesis. You've got a serpent. But it's, uh, that, that, that's a, a dicey thing there. But later on, you certainly have the notion of an adversary in the book of Job, which is written much later. But in the book of Job, it's just called the adversary, in, in the Hebrew, you could say that's adversary. Later, it gets to be translated Satan. But in the book of Job, in the prologue, God and this adversary, who is, by the way, among the, the uh, celestial beings, are having a conversation about the people on earth and about Job. And uh, th this being, this adversary, this uh, celestial being says, look, Job is just behaving well because he's got a good deal. If you gave him a lot of <clears throat> suffering, then he's not going to be such a nice guy after all. So in this kind of contest between uh, this being and who, who functions in the book of Job as a prosecuting attorney, Later, theologians turned in this into a cosmic demon called Satan. But I think in the book of Job, you, you can't do that so easily. Well, what they're trying to do is, this, this book of Job is probably a drama written by a Hebrew, uh, maybe a rabbi or a scholar before the rabbis. It's, it's hard to know for sure, because he doesn't say who his name is. It doesn't, doesn't give a name. But anyhow, you can see human minds working hard trying to go through this. So one of the people who, one of the persons who will come to Job will tell him that he is suffering now, uh, not because God put all this just for a test, but because he's not measuring up morally. In other words, blame him for the fact that his wife is dead and the, and the, and the tornado wiped out his family. You see, and so that's one of the theories that developed is that whenever there's suffering around the world, blame Adam and Eve first of all, and then all the offspring, and that gets God off the hook. But the book of Job is trying to show that's not so easy because God was supposed to have been able to look ahead in the first place. So you develop. In the Gospel of John, uh, in, in some of the texts, not all of them, is a guy born blind. And the question is, well, what sin did he commit? And it depends on how you punctuate the Greek. 
but the, the, the class, the Greek in which it was written doesn't have punctuation. And so you could say that uh, the one punctuation says, well, this man's relatives had sinned, or this man had sinned. The other says, with a period, it doesn't matter. See, in other words, you take the period out and it says, but that this may be cured or the will of God may be done is the literal meaning. It just goes on and doesn't give you an answer, you see. It just says, in effect, we've got a practical problem here of getting this man healed. Now, that brings up another question. Is the Bible, and most theology before, say, the, the 19th century, uh, had to deal without much of a germ theory? And viruses? Uh, these are all relatively modern theories. So how do you explain sickness? Well, one theory was that everything is controlled by conscious beings. So rather than blame God for all of this, who is omniscient in perfect control, presumably, then you say, well, there are demons and there are devils. And, and there is the head honcho, Satan, and then they create all these diseases. In fact, you have the uh, Zoroastrian religion growing out of Manichaeanism that has, in effect, two gods, one of them in charge of, of uh, darkness and the other in charge of light. But, but in a way, it's an awful lot of polytheism in there, even though these may be lesser gods. Uh -huh. Well, you have at least two gods in, in the, uh, the Manichaean and Zoroastrian view. And then you do have, uh, you do have gods. Uh, here he says, in the sons of gods, and this is an early chapter. Uh, and, and so you also have uh, uh, the, the problem that the, the Hebrews lived in a, in a Greek and Roman world which had lots of gods, so they had to come to terms with that, and they created... The, the, the Hebrews came up with the notion of uh, wisdom being with God as a co-creator, and that's almost, that's, that's a kind of compromise with, with polytheism. Not, not, and, but you can see, and then Satan is a kind of polytheism because it, it gets God off the hook, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see, these are, these are intelligent people with a theory that you, you may or may not accept, but they accepted it, and so they tried to work in it to try to make sense of it, and they're they're trying to problem solve. Yeah, it sounds it sounds to me that there's a lot of the uh, the, the the idea of the Greek gods, where uh -huh. man's misery are the result of uh, conflicts between Among the gods. Yeah. The, the oh gods. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. You can you can see uh, uh, some of the gods uh, as if uh, they're playing with. Uh, it's as almost as if the gods. We're writing their own script, and you got these characters down there called human beings. And in the book of Job, it's almost close to this. You've got God and, and then this prosecuting attorney uh, almost making a bet with each other. <laughs> and the collateral damage is, in, is enormous. Well, not, not so much to Job, as the, the story would say, but to, to his uh, family and uh, animals and things like that. Do we have a call in? Let's try and see. Uh, nope. I don't think we do. Well, we'll just... Okay. Let's move on now. Um, do we have a call in? Oh, let's try. Can we have your call in? We're... Hello. Uh, this is Forrest. And um, uh -huh. I'm sorry uh, I can't be there with you guys today. But um, I have a question for you, and it, it works like this. The way I read the Bible, suffering starts as God's retribution against Eve. That happens right in Genesis. And then almost immediately after that, Cain commits murder. And rather than retribution, God puts, like, a spell of protection on Cain. And I want to ask you, how in the world can that possibly be fair? You got oh. me on that? 
<laughs> yeah. You got him speechless for the moment. <laughs> I've got you. <laughs> so, you know, we, we have suffering is, is Eve's punishment for bringing knowledge in to, to the uh, human uh, race. Uh, uh, uh. And yet, Cain commits murder. You know, nowadays we think of that as, you know, the most serious of offenses. Yeah. How is this fair? Okay. I think you could say the early Hebrews were trying to wrestle with the problem of suffering and uh, human evil. If you exterminate everybody right away who does evil, <laughs> I mean, think it, of it. This is the earth. You, know, you got now at least four, about four people. Well, well, it's only three now. Now three. <laughs> so <laughs> you got now you're back to two. <laughs> so you can see they had to work with. They're like you and me. You see, they got to work with the situation as it is. There's one theologian, other theologians didn't like him, but he's, he, he referred to what he calls situational ethics. That ethics has a background, to say, of love, but then the, the love principle has to operate within a situation. And here is a, a classic example of situation ethics, is your, your progenitors... <laughs> The the, the, uh, the the next generation <laughs> is one male, and you want to knock him off, and then that's the end of the of the human species, and that's one of the problems they had to to deal with. By the way, in Genesis, you have a, a story of of God changing his mind and regretting that he had made. Uh, I mean, it, it's plain he regretted that he had made the human race and he has to he believes he has to exterminate most of them now this does not fit at all with the theological notion that God knows everything it's simply the, the Bible is has its own versions and I say versions there are many of them well isn't this idea of the omniscience, omniscience of God uh, a more recent Thing of, uh, um, you, you probably have some indications of it and some examples of it in the Bible. The reason is the Bible is not one book. That's a, that's a piece of fiction. It is a collection of a tradition of development of all kinds of literature, the authors of which most of them we don't know. Let's see if we've got a... Can we, do we have a caller? Yeah, I just want to call in on the comment uh -huh. uh, of the mark that God put on uh, Cain. Uh -huh. It wasn't uh, so much a mark of protecting Cain from himself, but it was a mark because of what God had done to him is that the people would want to kill him. So God had to put a mark so it was showing his love still for Cain even though he had rebelled and done wrong. His murder was very wrong. Well, thank you. That's a, good, a very good point. In other words, what you're saying, the mark on Cain, it was not a mark saying, this is the guy, get him. It's, you're saying it's the other way around. Uh, this is a mark. Uh, let's have mercy on him. Let's don't kill him. It would be like if someone killed your son or your child. Uh huh. Good, good, yeah. And, and naturally, in the humanistic mind, uh, you would want revenge no matter what. But even today, to them child molesters, we escort them under heavy guard. Uh -huh, it's not uh -huh. so much for the community, but for their protection. So that was the same thing that the mark that God put on Cain was so that, yeah, he committed, he had to suffer for that sin. Uh -huh. And he suffered it in his body by rejection. Very good. But it was to prevent the other people from killing him. Clobbering him, yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, you want to spell that out some more? I appreciate your comments on this. You're, you're welcome. Okay. You can, I, I think our caller is, is making a good point. It is these people had to deal with this situation. I mean, there are not that many people as, as it came to them. And as the man points out, you're going to have compassion on your own son, even if he's committed some heinous crime. That's whether you're a theist 
or an atheist or a humanist or not, uh, you're going to have some compassion. And now also, you, the, the sad part of this story <laughs> is, it, is they lost their other son, you see. <laughs> so it's, that's why it is an early tragedy. When you look at it, say, as, 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 let's suppose for the time being you take it as a literal story, you can see that it, it's heart-rending. Now, let's suppose it's not a literal story. It's a symbol and a story about all of us who have to make choices that are that, that difficult. That's the problem of suffering, the problem of tragedy. Tragedy, sometimes you've got to make choices which you can't do the best you would like to do. And here, I think, the, the, the caller did us, I think, a nice favor to point out. Here are parents who, in this story, are suffering and that's the problem we're dealing with is the question of, of uh, suffering and evil. And uh, we're also trying to deal with the question of evil. Uh, how does evil get started? Well, let's suppose it was the Adam and Eve thing. The, the early theologians knew that didn't work too well. And so they said, well, it was Satan. But then, after working with that, they came up with the notion, well, that doesn't work too well either, because didn't God know that Satan would do this before he made him? Furthermore, you have even a worse problem. Let's suppose you say, well, Satan has done all of this. And you say you buy that theory. Then why do you keep him going? Now, this is why the caller's uh, 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 comment is think, interesting. Here's God who has uh, Satan, and if, he's it, if he is one of these sons of God, you see, in the book of Genesis, he's his son and doesn't want to do away with him, you see. Now, the, the problem is, however, I mean, that sounds nice. Well, he's, passion, he's compassionate towards Satan. Didn't want to kill him because he's, you know, one of the sons of God. But in that same Bible, you have the God Yahweh wiping out whole countries, men, women, and children, with apparently no show of compassion at all because they're not, in that sense, they're on the other side. Now, that's a theory that... Um, a theory that, move, that moves from Darwin's theory helps explain this better, that we have built in our genes love toward insiders and hostility toward outsiders. And you can see this Darwinian theory running throughout the Bible, all up to the book of Revelation, which is love the insiders and literally the hell, literally, with the outsiders. And it, the book of Revelation, you read it, is full of love and full of meanness. The same guy is a brutal, he sounds like a sociopath. He is so mean. Whoever this John is that wrote it, it is so mean, he sounds like a, um, a, a sociopath who can love his own kind in hostility toward others. In that sense, it's a great book and it's a wicked book at the same time. <laughs> well, it, it, it certainly must have started out as a collection of stories, of mm -hmm. myths, uh, the, the kind of thing that uh, cultures pass down from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. And um, it, uh, it almost seems to me as a non-theologian and uh, a physical scientist rather than uh, a uh -huh, philosopher, uh -huh. uh, it... Um, it seems to me that it must have been at a later time they decided to attribute this to to add um, uh, this this uh, holiness to the word, um, and and uh, when when they start calling it the word of God now is when the problems come. Uh, yeah, now that, that yeah that, maybe maybe the early. Authors, uh, they, they didn't, uh, they didn't weren't anticipating all of this. No, oh, well, I'm sure they weren't any more than than we will anticipate a hundred years from now <laughs> if, we, if we're still around. Well, Plato, just barely across the water there, I mean, it's not that far across the Mediterranean. Uh, 
was about the time that they were at least uh, editing the book of Genesis. When it was written exactly, we can't be sure. But by the time they were editing, Plato was over there writing. He had a theory in the Timaeus that um, God was the, uh, the demiurge or the, um, the architect. That's the Greek word, uh, demiurge. Now. It's, it's not the d- devil. It's, yeah. it's the architect. And that God had the, the eternal standards that he didn't create. They are just the eternal standards are already there forever and ever. And God has a vision of them. And then there's the world of energy that God did not create. But he takes it and tries to shape the world according to these ideals or the forms. And he's very successful, except the world of energy doesn't always fit perfectly. And that's how you account for some of the the chaos in the world and some of the evil in the world. And then... By the time you get to uh, centuries later, Augustine and, uh, and then even and, 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 uh, Thomas Aquinas, they held the notion that God didn't start with a prim- the primordial energy. They start from scratch. Or God starts from scratch and can make the world any way he wants to. Or he wants to, you see. Mm-hmm. And so then they, uh, Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, have a real problem because if God started with no encumbrances, uh, no material, and he can create it the way he wants to, then with all this suffering, it's even more of a problem for Augustine and Thomas Aquinas than it would say for the biblical writers who don't have that complex a, a theory, it seems to me. Uh, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of stories about, uh, like someone will tell a little inconsequential lie but then they have to cover it up with another and another and another and pretty soon it just grows out of control Uh, by analogy it it seems that uh, the more uh, godlike authority they give to the Bible then the more difficulty they have in reconciling and covering up would you agree that in some aspects of science I don't like the lie analogy but it, it, it it's okay. a, but it, because I don't want to get people mo- motives but a lie well let's let's take you've got Jesus going up then you've got the problem of Jesus's lungs okay I mean he's got a body but you got to then you got to have another miracle to take care of those lungs then you got to have another miracle so in that sense miracles are like lies if you've got to have one you got to have another to patch up the other problems and it keeps going and science and thinking is the same way. Once you try to develop a theory, you've got to do a lot of reworking. <laughs> and that's why I admire these writers, because you can see how they're trying to, to rework it. They're, they're, I'm a humanist, and I see, I read the Bible as, a, as these are human beings doing what I'm doing the best we can. And that's what the theologians did years later, trying to take the Bible. And they worked, re- Calvin, for example, had the strange notion, from my point of view, that God had total control of everything. And therefore, Satan was his agent. And then God wanted, wanted to have some to suffer damnation forever and ever. And he wanted some to be in heaven forever and ever. And so, like a great script writer, he then wrote the lines, as it were, all the, all the words, all the acts, and then he created the roles, Judas and, and Peter and Paul and Moses and Melchizedek and Nebuchadnezzar and all of them to play these roles. Now, if you are uh, one of the good guys, you think that's great. You've got a great part. If you're Judas, then Judas goes to hell and suffers forever and ever for the sins of others, while Jesus goes to hell, according to one theory, for two or three days, and he's back again getting praises. And yeah. Judas, Judas is saying, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but uh, Judas always thought, I, I always thought Judas was somewhat of a scapegoat, because without Judas betraying Jesus... It wouldn't have the, come off. It, the rest wouldn't have come off. And, and, and the word scapegoat, I think, works. That's exactly what it is. Now, what is 
What's ironic is Jesus is supposed to have been the replacement of the old scapegoat in the Hebrew Bible, the animal sacrifice. You put your hands on the goat and he takes the sins. Jesus becomes the, the scapegoat. But what you're saying is the one who really pays the price to suffer more than Jesus or anybody else on, uh, who's going to heaven is Judas, who, would, according to Calvin, who was, one of the, in my opinion, one of the great sociopaths of all time. <laughs> now, that's my opinion. But he says that God deliberately invented Jesus. Judas invented him with the text and all the feelings to make him an evil person so that he could get punished forever and ever and be used to betray Jesus. Now, that is the problem of evil. <laughs> that's not a solution to the problem of evil. That's a contribution to it. Calvinism, then, in my opinion, is a theological venture in sociopathology. John Stuart Mill came up with the notion, who was a, a great thinker of the, uh, the 19th century, wrote a great essay called On Liberty. I'll, I'll deal with him. We've got a caller coming in. Let's see what it is. Let's see. Go ahead, please. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, you gentlemen have been discussing the subject, the problem of suffering. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering if you might do so in the context of the current world. Uh, without reference to the Bible, uh, but perhaps from a moral philosophy point of view, and examine the types of suffering we have going on in many countries all over the world today, but without reference to the Bible. Sure. In fact, we did that earlier. Uh, you did? Mm -hmm, sure. I'll do it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you alluded. Yeah, we alluded. We did, and, and yeah, the caller is right. We didn't get into the detail, but we mentioned the amity amity complex. Uh, mentioned. Go ahead with that. I didn't mean to. Well, I, I, I was going to say uh, uh, we're at the midpoint, mm -hmm. and the second part of our um, talk today mm -hmm. deals more with the natural uh, approach, naturalistic Good. approach mm -hmm. to suffering, and I think that is. What the caller is about. What the caller is about. Mm -hmm. So, um, caller, hang on. If um, and and I'm going to be replaced by Larry. Okay. I hope. Okay. Uh, so go, go um, ahead, and I'll, and I'll do this uh, amity. Go ahead, come in, Larry. Sam, why don't you give? Uh, but uh, do, uh, let's don't leave our caller hanging. The, the, a naturalistic approach would be something like this: that we are genetically uh, in the same boat with other. Uh, species and it's called the amity enmity complex that you have bonding with your group and you have hostility toward the outsiders and you can you can find that among baboons you can find it among birds squirrels um, you can find it in in fish it seems to be uh, universally genetic and much of what we call human evil in the sense of harm and hurt and unloving comes out of that paradox, it seems, of love toward insiders closing in, nurturing in hostility, which is a kind of protectionism against outsiders. Go. Hello, I'm Larry Rhodes. Came in on the break. Uh, this is Free Thought Forum. All our lines are open for your calls. Um, you can call them. Still on, on the screen. line, guys. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, go, go. Sorry. Do, do I missed that. Okay. I was thinking more of, of an explanation, not a naturalistic one, where you're comparing species, uh, but one that deals with the modern world and modern humanity, and the civilizations that exist today. And uh, I'd like to have an explanation of how, uh, since you folks are, are not uh, biblical, you, you're atheists or agnostics, um, how you think that your definitions of morality could help with the types of suffering, human suffering, that we have all across the globe today. 
Well, I think it's based on human empathy. Um, you don't want to suffer, and, and by projection, you, you can imagine that other people who are suffering would rather not be suffering. It's not a hard thing to, to uh, understand. Um, one of the things I brought in to talk to, talk to uh, people today about was uh, Mother Teresa. Uh, a lot of people have the uh, impression that she would helped alleviate a lot of suffering in the world. Um, and, but one, one person in particular, uh, Hi Christopher Hitchens, wrote mm -hmm. a book called Missionary Position. Mother Teresa in theory and in practice. But she really wasn't there to relieve suffering. She was there to help you endure and uh, make sure that the suffering was, was ongoing almost. She called it uh, Jesus kissing you. Um, the, the, um, the Bible and the religious, um, very religious people think that uh, suffering is, is uh, a good thing. It can be uh, um, well, beneficial in fact, to the person. Yeah, Mother Teresa, another two Teresas, this one, mm -hmm. uh, is, was a, opposed to birth control, mm -hmm. which I consider to be, I, I, I want to speak very frankly, I mm -hmm. consider that to be a moral evil. Mm -hmm. Uh, these yeah. people. She was against condom use specifically. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and she, and I think that would uh, that was evil, in a see there, there are two ways of thinking of evil in the sense of as our caller I think was getting it, mm -hmm. is there's there's a natural evil in the sense of tornadoes and destruction like that, right? Which we are we, we are not responsible for. and we respond to. Them. But there's moral evil, and that's whenever we do harm. And I think Mother Teresa, who did a lot of good in helping people who were poor, mm -hmm. but she also did a lot of harm in not trying to get at the source of some of this po right. poverty. And, and she, she still, uh, she and her people, her nuns and everything, were, were not really there to help the, the people, just, just well, to um, make them comfortable as they could, but to, to, they wouldn't... Um, well, they wouldn't help by getting at the source of the right. problem. They, they wouldn't they take were the helping money to, to, that they to, got and started a hospital. Like uh, the people who gave the money thought that she should. She would open more convents, uh, which would allow more people to practice the type of uh, teachings that the Catholic Church yeah. would promote. Now, here would be, uh, uh, now there, uh, let's be fair to the, the Catholics. They do create hospitals. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Well, I mean, they've, they've set up some. Okay, yes. but that, that's the point. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're trying to alleviate suffering. Mm -hmm. Mike, here we have a specific problem. Is one way to alleviate suffering of poverty is don't simply generate children you can't take care of. Right. I mean, that's common sense. Mm -hmm. But the, the Catholic hierarchy, not, not necessarily every priest, but the Catholic hierarchy has consistently opposed birth control, mm -hmm. and even in the 1950s called birth control murder, the way some people today like mm -hmm. to think that um, abortion is murder. And many people think the Pope himself ought to be arrest arrested for, for fighting against condom use in age-ridden uh, Africa. I mean, think of how many people are going to die because he's fighting birth control, uh, specifically condom use. Yeah. Uh, even he even issued a uh, statement saying the condom use made it worse, made you more likely. Well, some, get, some of the Catholics are taking uh, issue with that yeah, as they should. Yeah, some of the nuns, in particular, who mm -hmm. have to work with people suffering, mm -hmm. they say, "Well, this guy's living off in a world all, all of his mm -hmm. own." So true. And so, well, mm -hmm. to get back to our caller is the the, the problem then is. You, uh, you got two problems. One is how to explain how all of this kind of suffering in, er, erupts and comes about, and you have grand theories, and, you, and, and scientists is all scientists are always trying to have a general theory. Right. Then you got specifics, like how does this specific disease develop at this particular locality? Mm -hmm. So, uh, now the, the amity amity thing it explains a lot. But not everything. It explains why one country invades another country because they are outsiders and they are fair game. Or they may have something that they want. They like want their to land steal or their, it, yeah. or their ore or their oil. <laughs> yeah. uh, or there are lots of different reasons for invading a country, but the insider outsider thing is, is a very basic uh, understanding yeah. of that. And, and you could say this that what morality has been over the centuries is the attempt to cross over those barriers so that what was an enemy try try to make a friend or a neighbor mm -hmm. and i think you could you could do a history of ethics and see this is what you call 
empathy mm -hmm. and human compassion is a way of saying those people over there are not and are they are the, not they're not the other they're the, they're, they're, they're us yeah. yeah and that's what's called the the brotherhood and then in, in the 20th century we started talking about the sisterhood too we got over just the brotherhood right see that's another boundary mm -hmm. if you read some 19th century literature toward women they treat them as if they're half of spe uh, half of uh, some other species right um, Doctors mm -hmm. Without Borders is a good a good example of people who try to break down the borders between countries and uh, peoples yeah. and go out there and relieve suffering on their own, no matter what nationality you are. Uh, the suffering is is the the reason that they're there, not <clears throat> not to produ uh, promote their own agenda, their own ideology. Uh, they're and they're they're a secular organization as uh -huh. well. You know, they're not pushed by any particular religion. That's a that's a good point. <clears throat> um, another thing. Uh, it, uh, the, this caller or other callers would call and say, how can you have your own morality without the Ten Commandments? What, what rules do you follow? Well, we have had a history of humanity of trying to come up with our own rules, and the current state of our rules is our law. Go down to the capital, go into the, uh, the area where they, have, they keep the laws that are all up to date, and read our, our ex what we expect people to follow uh, to be a part of our society. It minimizes harm, it, uh, it punishes uh, wrongdoing, uh, it, it... Thievery, it, murder... It defines lying. what wrongdoing is, yeah. and all within a secular framework. Yeah, in fact, you could make a real case that if you look at all cultures, mm -hmm. all cultures have had to develop a rule against murder. Now, why? Because you don't want to be murdered yeah, yourself. Well, yeah, you don't want to be murdered <laughs> yourself. And then if you murder your right. own your own clan, you don't have a clan. Right. And without a You're clan... You're an outcast immediately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it's... And the word common sense in that sense is common consensus. They, mm -hmm. they, they could see it is self-interest to have moral rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. uh, stealing, for example, is wrong because if everybody's going around stealing, there's nothing to steal. If you, well, let's say you're a professional even if thief. if you stole something, somebody would steal it from steal you. Steal it. Yeah. yeah. So. If, you're, if you were a professional thief, you would not want to legalize thievery. Thievery. Mm -mm. Otherwise, you couldn't make a living. No. No. Uh, again, we don't have a caller now, <laughs> so well. you can call in. 215-2288, talking about the problem of suffering. Um, we... Uh, have two secular organizations here in Knoxville uh, that you might want to become a part of if you, like us, are non-believers. Uh, the Atheist Society of Knoxville. And, and the East Tennessee Rationalists. And the Rationalists yeah, of East Tennessee. Uh, you can go to either one of these uh, websites there, uh, read more about us, um, come down and join us. Like after the show, we'll be down in, in the old city at um, Barley's Tap Room in Pizzeria. Uh, we'll be probably be down there till 7 or 7.30 or so, and you're welcome to join us. Um, but no, a, a lot of people ask atheists, uh, or ask mm -hmm. us, what, uh, what do you consider wrong if you don't have God to tell you what's wrong? Well, one basis of it is uh, suffering. Uh, suffering is wrong. If you cause suffering in another person, that's wrong. If you cause uh, cause yourself to suffer, it's not so bad. It's, I mean, you, you take responsibility for your own actions, mm -hmm. but suffering is a good yardstick to measure yeah. for what is wrong in society. Yeah, e even a surgeon who causes suffering does it has to in mm -hmm. order to relieve greater suffering. Greater suffering. So and he I, keeps the suffering at a minimum while he's doing it. Yeah. Uh, harm, later, harm later we should another. probably do a whole program on uh, freedom and happiness mm -hmm. and, and how morality develops out of our desire to get to maximize our freedom mm -hmm. and to maximize our happiness right. uh, and eliminate right. pain. Mm -hmm. Those of you out there who think that suffering is a good thing, uh, ask yourself why. I mean, examine the question. Don't just accept that as a as a statement from your religious teaching or ideology why would you think suffering is good um, looking in the Bible for uh, examples uh, Job suffered more than just about anybody else in the Bible I get, I think you talked about that already maybe uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, you know they always say well God, God gave him back everything he lost uh, no he didn't <laughs> he didn't give him back his wife or his children he gave him new so, ones yeah, they were. so uh, his suffering did not end at the end of the uh, the wager. Yeah, if he, if, he, if he had a Satan had. if he had a human heart at all, he wouldn't say to himself, mm -hmm. "Well, I'm not so bad off. I've right. got a replacement, like you got mm -hmm. a new car." Mm -hmm. Well, people are not like cars, and 
and television. No. But why? The main difference is that cars and televisions don't suffer. They don't feel pain, which is the basis. If you had no feelings of pain or pleasure, uh, you wouldn't have any point to ethics at all. If you had just atoms knocking about, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have to worry about Or writing. if you lived alone on an island, there would be no real uh, basis for morality because you wouldn't be interacting with anybody else. You could cause suffering to yourself, or try to, but you would still try to keep it to a minimum. minimum. Yeah, you'd still have to have personal ethics to, personal to keep ethics. yourself safe. If I, if but, I eat this, I'll have diarrhea for a week. Mm -hmm. So you but say, they, they would even then be changing. Mm -hmm. Once you found something that's bad for you, you would stop doing that yeah. and get something else. Um, to uh, no, they, talk they, about they, situational ethics. Yeah. Uh, let me give you another example of, a, of a, uh, a person who was in the tradition of Christianity and yet was in the, he, he was an evolutionist mm -hmm. and a Darwinist uh, in, in the 20th century trying to develop science. This is after Heisenberg. I mean, he, he's in very good company with the, the, uh, the great Some physicist the great and minds. biologist, and he was trying to put his theory of God together with that, and he came up with the notion that God has a, uh, and this is E.S. Brightman, a will to value, to create all values possible with order and structure. So that's the will to, it had a rational given, that was the, that is, the, the mind of God is rational, all the structure of the world is, is another word for God, as it were, mm -hmm. and then but there is what he calls a non-rational given, and that's all the energy of God does not simply harmonize. It goes in directions, mm -hmm. and consequently, you have things getting out of harmony. Mm -hmm. So once again, he's using God as a cover for things that he doesn't know. It's a classic argument from ignorance. Uh, if we don't know what happened, well, God did it, God's intention is there, or that is God. In other words, it's just a Band-Aid saying, we don't know. Okay, is that a caller we have coming in? No, not, not yet. yet. Not yet. No. Okay. Let me be fair to Brightman. Uh, <laughs> he, and he strikes me as very much like any scientist with a theory that he's trying to say, I don't want to throw the whole theory out until I have a better theory mm -hmm. that's worked out in detail. And what he's doing, is, and I think this is what scientists do, is you take the theory you got and you modify it and modify it and modify it. Mm -hmm. Honing so, in on the truth, coming yeah. closer and closer yeah. to the truth as you do. And sometimes you modify it so much that you've actually got another theory. A and separate I think, theory. Yeah. And something yeah, else comes into yeah, the equation yeah. that you then have Didn't to explain have, and start a new yeah. theory about. And I think this is what happened to Brightman. He, mm -hmm. he actually said that the whole universe, physical universe, is the divine body. Now, let's just think what he's trying to say. Mm -hmm. That means it's structure, order, uh, it's interacting, and it's got patterns and laws. Now. Whether you buy it or not, you can see here's a mind trying to put his theories together to solve the problem of evil. And what's interesting to me is his ethics, and he is a personalistic theist, and John Dewey's, who is a naturalist, their ethics are virtually the same. In fact, Brightman wrote a book on ethics, a huge book that lays out what a, any Darwinian would say, yeah, that makes a lot, a lot of sense. So what I'm saying is, is I want to try in this way not to be with the amity enmity complex. I don't want to say these are aliens and they don't have any thinking at all. Mm -hmm. Brightman had a lot of rational thinking that the naturalist Dewey could have learn, learned from, and Dewey had a lot of thinking that the theist Brightman, and they, they, they met together often in, in these meetings to share ideas, and they had enough sense to learn from each other. And I think we all profit from it. But how much can you change your theory or change your, uh, your way of thinking if you've got an ideology that's set in a, in a book that you cannot say any part of is wrong? Well, I'm, tr can... yeah, I'm trying to show that the book itself is a history of revisions and oh, adaptations, yeah. mm -hmm. so that it's not just one, the Bible itself does not have one theory of God. That's a piece of fiction mm -hmm. invented 
by some theologians. That's a good point. Mostly by, by preachers who don't do either theology right. or know the Bible that well. And, or either, or know it, but don't preach it. Yeah, what's interesting is in the debate over creationism and evolution, you have a lot of people who don't know much about either one of them. All right. Welcome to yeah. Free Thought Forum. May we have your name? Um, Allison. Allison. Hello, Allison. Do you have a question or comment? Well, I came into the program late, and uh, and I've been listening about 10 or 15 minutes, and I, I'm just kind of confused. The, it, the topic was the problem of suffering, mm -hmm. but it seems that the conversation has just been all over the place. And I wonder if you could just give me kind of an, in a nutshell, what it is you're trying to communicate about this topic, because I'm kind of lost. Well, let me just play, say one thing first. Yeah. You did come in late, uh, because we do start at 5 o'clock now. Uh, for the, you know, those of you that are coming in at 5.30, we did get a whole hour segment starting a couple weeks ago. So do begin to tr uh, tune in at 5 o'clock now. And I'm sorry to... Well, so yeah, she's got a good question, though. Very good question. How, how can you get a... You, uh, the, the woman wants to say, how do you get a handle on, <laughs> on this? Which is a, uh, is a sensible question. Mm -hmm. And um, if you'll bear with me just half a minute, let me try this. It's, we were... We've got two problems. One is a theoretical problem to try to explain how the suffering and stuff came about in general. And that's not easy. Then you have the very practical problem that, that nurses and doctors and mothers and fathers try to deal with is how do you deal with specific suffering. But to, to, one of the main things is how, how come there's suffering at all okay. if there's an all-loving God that cares, who loves us more than any parent loved any child? Why would he allow suffering? Well, that's why we, we said that the, the theologians had to come up with a theory. In other words, they had the problem, as we pointed early in this hour, that God is omnip, uh, omnipotent, that is all power and all knowing so, and, so, and all good. So why is there suffering? And uh, the theologians tried to come up with the notion of the Satan. And, and they've uh, had several thousand years <laughs> and, and to work that, on their story. And that not, has not worked at all. No. Because they, they, these same theologians believe, most of them believe in capital punishment. So you'd say, well, why don't you put Satan to death and not have the problem? <laughs> or lock <laughs> him up. Or, lock or, him or up take his yeah. powers away. Yeah. yeah How are so. mortal men supposed to stand up against a supernatural hero? In fact, it'd be immoral. It would be immoral Demon. Yeah, not to do that, wouldn't you think? Mm -hmm. Well, that theory of, of the devil, many theologians today simply say, well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a, a piece of fiction trying to get at the problem. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, another uh, uh, way of trying to deal with this is, is to say that there is no intelligent mind controlling it all. Now, Calvin tried it, saying that God controlled every disease, every illness, and he, in, he invented all the scripts so that he knew exactly who would be suffering and when because he planned it that way. And that sounds utterly cruel. Mm -hmm. Other Christians have come up with other views of that and other Jewish scholars to try to say there is evil in the world and suffering. How's it come about? And what the naturalists are saying is there's no one who planned the world so that it would be perfectly without pain and agony. It's not saying pain and agony are good. It's simply saying that's just the way the universe is. We are, we are in a world in which pain and suffering and goodness and wonder and love and hope and misery are all in it. And we would say that it's, it's all natural because there's no God guiding any of this. It's just we're, there's, the world is full of pain because we're natural creatures. Um, that experience harm and uh, and disease and w weather conditions yeah. like tsunamis and earthquakes, it just happens. It's it's part of the uh, natural world. Let's hear from our our, our caller. Are, are you still there? I am. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, you going back over that. And, and let me ask you uh, another thing. You know that I have heard since, and, and I'm not sure I heard this correctly. Um, you were talking about ethics um, uh -huh. uh, associated with suffering, and did I understand you to say that without suffering there would be no ethics, or without ethics there would be no suffering? Somehow they're connected? Oh, uh, uh, okay. Um, it, 
I would that. say that the bare bones of ethics would be that you're trying to do the least uh, harm or cause the least amount of suffering in the world. Uh, I'd say they're very well connected. Yeah, uh, she's getting at something important, and I hope we're not missing it. You, uh, would you develop this a little bit more? I think you're getting at something. I'm going to hang up and, and listen to you. Thank you very much. Okay. I, I think uh, uh, we're not saying that suffering is good to have. We're saying uh, that it's something that's inevitable. In, in many areas, it's inevitable. Uh, in, in other areas, it's not inevitable, but it will happen unless we do something about it. And so ethics is a way of trying to control suffering and to alleviate suffering and try to make human pleasure and happiness uh, come about more. Mm -hmm. say. In fact, we need to devote a whole, whole section on that. We have uh, just a few minutes left. We might have time for one more caller real quick. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to mention that a Freedom From Religion Foundation is working for the separation of church and state, and they have mm -hmm. a, a monthly or bi-monthly magazine that they send out, Free Thought Today. Go to www, oh, it's not www, it's just ffrf.org, that's ffrf.org, and mm -hmm. uh, ask for a free copy of the Free Thought um, Today magazine. Matter of fact, the, the, the uh, church-state separation principle mm -hmm. was developed, as, in my opinion, as an ethical principle so that all of the churches and the atheists and agnostics and the believers and non-believers of various religions and non-religions could mm -hmm. work together in peace and quiet. And live side by side in the same society. And they can have choices. Mm -hmm. There's an old saying about, uh, you better hope religion doesn't get into the government, because if it does, it's very likely not going to be yours. Yeah. There's so many different sects of religion, uh, different uh, callings of religion. You can guarantee it'll corrupt it. Uh, right. I mean, we've got too much a history major, on Whichever one gets in, a major portion, the major portion of society will not be represented. Yeah. And the, and, and the and church the, itself will be corrupted mm -hmm. right. by the state. You right. can guarantee it. Mm -hmm. And then also the church will help corrupt the state. If they get together. So true. So true. Um, still have time for maybe a very short call. Um, yeah, if we could have another call, we'd yeah. be very, yeah. very pleased. Now, these are very good calls we've had. Yeah. Yeah. If you'd uh, like to send us some feedback, you can leave us a voicemail at 272-9600. That's a, a telephone line that we've got available for the show. Um, it will uh, it will be almost like an email, and if you call, it will uh, transcribe your message to us and send it to us in an email. So that's very cool. Uh, you can also write us at freethoughtforum at yahoo.com. Again, we're on every Tuesday, every week at 5 o'clock. Uh -huh. It's a one-hour show now, so be sure to mark your calendar. If you want to uh, get copies of previous shows, you can order them on DVD mm -hmm. uh, by calling this this number above us. Uh, they will put several uh, shows on a single DVD. You want to take a chance on that one? We hear the phone ringing. Okay. Um, and we're getting down to the last few minutes. Okay. Well, let's say um, that we've had two or three really good callers to suggest that maybe this this is a topic that we've just barely scratched mm -hmm. the surface, and that's true. Yeah, that's so true. so we, we could, the whole problem of suffering from a strictly naturalistic point of view mm -hmm. deserves an entire it does. hour. Yeah. And this has been Free Thought Forum. I'm Larry Rhodes. And un unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, let's see if we've got one more caller. Go ahead. Hello? Hello? Go, yes, go ahead. Hurry. Yes, I think the guy on the list is... 